Welcome to another episode of Culinary School Stories, the weekly podcast that is dedicated to sharing the stories of people around the globe whose lives have been influenced, impacted, touched, and or enriched, for good or for bad, from their culinary school experience. Hi, my name is Colin Roach and I'm your host. Thanks for joining us today. You are an important part of this show where we ask the question, what's your culinary school story? So now, without any further delay, let's meet today's guest. Hello, and welcome to season three of the Culinary School Stories podcast, a proud member of the Food Media Network. I hope you follow the show and have subscribed to the podcast because it's free. We would love to have you as part of our community. You can follow the show and subscribe through your favorite podcast app, such as Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or through our website at www.culinaryschoolstories.com, which is also where we store all of the podcast's past episodes, as well as our guests' bios and contact information. So be sure to check it out at culinaryschoolstories.com. So now, without any further delay, I would like to introduce today's guest, who has a great story to share with all of us. Chef Judy Doherty has numerous culinary and hospitality-based degrees and certificates from multiple institutions, including the Culinary Institute of America and Johnson & Wales University. She is also a culinary educator, photographer, and successful entrepreneur who currently operates multiple businesses. Welcome to the show, Judy, and thanks for joining us today. Uh, thank you, Chef Colin, for having me. I'm thrilled to be on your show. Great. I know we've got a lot to get to. I read through some of your bio. I'm excited to find out all about that. But why don't we start from the beginning like we always do and all good stories are. Where did your love of cooking start and where did the, how did that manifest to take you into this as a career? Oh, um, I guess that the starting point is always a good question. Well, when I was young, my grandmother had an amazing ability to not only grow her own food, but to cook. She made so many delicious things, oatmeal with raisins. I think I have that on my bio. Just everything she made was really good. And she always let me help her in the kitchen. But the real way that I got into it as a career was just, I wanted to buy a car when I was a teenager and got a job at a restaurant. And I think the one thread that I've loved through my whole career is just the people in the industry. Every kitchen seems to have that certain amount of teamwork and the people that you work with are like family. And I think that's really what drew me in was just, you know, the people part of the business. Yeah, it's so true. They're so welcoming, right? And they always open doors and you can always find a job. Yeah, the people part of the industry is just wonderful. And to work with food in a food service way is so interesting. It's a lot different than being at home. You know, you get to see huge, massive quantities and just styles of cooking and types of foods that you've never seen before. So I think there was just that intrigue with it. And no two days are ever the same. <laughs> That's true. So you love the food. You grew up with it. Now you're going to culinary school. What what made you choose the school that you did first, and uh, and how was that? How was that process? How did your family take it? Were you excited? Tell us about that journey. Ah, okay. That kind of has a funny story. Um, so I was working. It was kind of like a fast casual place, and they were opening a really high end gourmet restaurant, and I got promoted to work into that. And everybody that worked there was from the CIA. They were all, you know, like chefs of saucier chefs and fish chefs and you know because this was a long time ago so you had kind of like what they called the classic for god and they took me under their wing like i learned fast i think and i just and where was this restaurant this was in florida it florida. was in margate and it was a restaurant called the chesapeake it was a really long time ago um really high-end you know gourmet seafood house so Everybody loved teaching me stuff, you know, and telling me about the CIA. And I thought, you know, I really love this and want to do it. And I, my parents were not thrilled with that. You know, they didn't like the hours. <laughs> like I had to drive kind of far to the restaurant. I still made straight A's in school, but they just really didn't like the hours. And so I said, I'll apply for the following year to the CIA. And when I applied, I got in that fall because somebody probably just didn't read the year. They thought if you're applying, you know, because you're out of high school, you want to start in September. And when I got accepted, I thought, I want this. And I remember telling my dad, 
I had a lot of money saved and I said, I'll do it with you or without you. Cause I'm 18. <laughs> I'm going. <laughs> and I did, I paid for it. Yeah. And it was really great. I loved my time there. Um, did, did you visit the school first or you just no. applied online, took it and said, I'm going pack it Well, on. you couldn't even apply online, Colin, like that shows my age. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I was there at the most glorious time. Like President Metz was there and they were just starting the Culinary Olympics. American Bounty wasn't open yet. Um, you had the whole culinary team there and the master chefs and the chefs that I studied with. You know, I think they were really good. So it was a great experience. You know, I really enjoyed it. Now, this was, as you mentioned a while back, was there was there as many females in the industry as there is today? No, I mean, were uh, you like one of um, a few up there? Out of our class of 72, there was four women. Whoa. But I ne it never I never looked at it that way. I think because I was so used to just working in the kitchen with men, it was probably an easier time. It was like if you were just you know worked hard and did your work, it didn't really matter. Mm -hmm. I feel like it matters more now, even though there's more women in the industry. There's just um, I don't know. <laughs> it's harder now. Yeah, I think that's all industries now. It just seems to be. I think it's all industries now. There's just more awareness and more issues and more things on social media and just more people and more issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that that's just a natural part of things. Our world moves very quickly in a digital way. Now, when you were there, did you study culinary or yes. baking and pastry? And why did you pick the one that you, you did? Well, when I went, Colin, the only thing you could take was their AOS degree. Hmm. It was that or nothing. There was no other like specialty. There was no certificates, no bachelors. I mean, certainly I just graduated from the master's. That wasn't there either. So you just took it. But, you know, they really prepared you to be well-rounded. And I think the work that I did in the industry at that time, I worked in a five-star French restaurant. So I got very good at what I studied on that externship. Um, I feel like that restaurant would have been the equivalent of a Michelin three-star. Um, there was only 13 five-star restaurants in the country. Uh, you know, I worked with just all Europeans that were I mean, at that time, that was kind of a big deal because that was the foundation of cuisine and they had an incredible apprenticeship. So if you got to work with them, I mean, you really learned good culinary skills. I still use them, mm -hmm. you know, with the knife and things like that. And they they hired me, you know, when I got out of school, I stayed there for a while. And then a, one of my classmates had a really great opportunity in Arizona and he needed a pastry chef. So if you're going to ask me, like, how did you decide to specialize? Yeah. So the deal was they were building a second country club. He said, right now, we really need a pa pastry chef. We're building another club. You know, when I go to run that, you could run this. I think that's how the story went. But when it came time to do all that, I wanted to stay in pastry. You know, it was very artistic and a lot of fun. I went on to take, you know, more pastry classes and I went on to work for Hyatt. Mm -hmm. You know, I was the executive pastry chef of one of their best hotels. Now, do you think if when you first went to CIA, if they had offered at that time a baking and pastry as as well as a culinary, you would have picked baking and pastry? You still would have went culinary? No, because I, I went there wanting to be a chef. Mm -hmm. I mean, the whole pastry chef thing was an accident. They were like, yeah, and the funny thing was I did a lot of extracurricular activities at school. I belonged to a lot of clubs like Saucier's Club, ACF Junior, I think it was like an ACF Junior Achievement Club. And there was just all sorts of things going on where you could volunteer. And those were so valuable mm -hmm. with the lessons that you learned and the networking and the chefs that were running those. It, it was just amazing. And the funny thing, I guess, because my mom is an artist and I just had the mind to understand the chemistry of food and the art of it, I would always end up doing the desserts. They were like, Judy can do that. Just, I think they saw that I could, I could ice the cake and cut the cake. And, and I think like Al, Al remembered that when he invited me mm -hmm. to be his pastry chef, yeah. you know, it just sounded good. And Arizona sounded fun. You're young. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. And, but then I really fell in love with the art of it. You know, I started reading all these books. Um, the big deal back then was like all the Chez Panisse books, the farm to table. I started, you know, just really being very creative with the pastry. Mm -hmm. It was like, you're out, like you could come in and make all these amazing things and then just go and have a life after work. You know, you could work days and be artistic. So I think that's why I loved it. Now, 
Tell us about going there because you know, we have a lot of listeners that are thinking about going to culinary school. Or maybe this year they're just going to culinary school. Okay. It's going to be different, you know, especially if they're going to the CIA. It's changed. They have multiple campuses. But yes. what was going through your head as you're pulling into campus? This is your first day. You're going to get all your equipment, your uniforms. You got to get dorms. I mean, tell us kind of like a little bit about that day. Um, I remember I think you're just so busy trying to get it all done and I think the big deal that I remember, as you could probably appreciate, is going from Florida to New York, like you're going there in the fall and it's like, oh my God, it's cold. I don't really have the winter coat. So you're like, my roommates were really nice and I felt prepared, I think, because of all the people I worked with, they kind of just said, you know, this will be a breeze um, or, you know, make sure you study hard for this. Like you felt like you had the inside story and everybody was so nice. It felt familiar. And I think I was more worried about just getting ready for the winter Yeah. and, you know, just getting everything ready to go to school, I guess, you know, the, your uniforms, the books, and I like having your, all your mise en place together to, to go to class. And I just remembered, this is so much fun. Like when you'd walk down the halls and see, you know, everything going on, like eating, eating in the great hall was just really fun. It was huge mm -hmm. with all the tables and there was the students that were the waiters and somebody would drop a tray and everybody would clap. It was just really <laughs> when I have, and I'm friends with a lot of my classmates on Facebook, like the memories, you know, that we have from that. Right, right. Now they, they, you were obviously confident sounds like, and they said it was going to be a breeze for you. Was it a breeze when you got there? Was it like a shock? Like, whoa, this is a little harder. Was it easier? Tell us about the, the difficulty, the rigor. I think that I'm a lifelong student. Like I was a straight A student that never had less than a 96. So academically it was easy. Um, I think what you had to learn is to get along with all the people and all the teachers. You know, I think every student probably knows that like you can go into a class and teachers want a certain thing. And it's not always very clear when an assignment or rubric is written and you have to figure that out. You know, there were some teachers that just wanted to make sure that you really had your act together in the kit. We had this famous one. He'd run around and he would trick you. He'd dump things into pots or shut the stove off. He wanted to see that your eyes were on that stove, not just that could you make this consomme, but that your eyes were on the stove or there was, you know, the bakery ones wanted to see that everything was really weighed out and that you were mixing things really the right way. There's just every teacher wanted a certain thing. So I think that's always the challenge for any school anywhere. Right. That part was hard, but mostly it was just fun. Yeah. You know, I think that probably the harder things were maybe like the dining room classes, mm. like memorizing all this. I don't know if they do that as much now. Or getting up at two in the morning for the butcher class, because we had to go down there and smell all that meat and deliver that. <laughs> there was just like every class, you know, had its things, but mostly we were learning. I think what students, they want to feel like they know how to skin the chicken because they just learned that. And you get into another class and the chef says, no, this is the way we're going to do it. So there was always that. Probably you see that now with culinary students that you have to never stop learning I guess multiple ways to do something and, and whoever yeah. the person in charge is wants it their way. And But mostly it was just exciting. There was like so much going on. You'd walk down the hall and there was like all the salt sculptures that Clyde Buchenkirk had made and come home with the gold medal from the culinary Olympics. And there was all this talk of terroir and opening the American bounty. And, you know, there was, the fun of hearing what's talking to other students to hear what they're learning and what they're making and getting to eat all that food and see chocolate stuff. I mean, it was just like your eyes were always open looking at things that you just, it was like a big discovery. Mm -hmm. You know, in college is fun. You have friends that are all there wanting to do something. Like I think everybody wishes their lives just stayed like that. <laughs> And then, then you went on to Johnson and Wales. How much time was it between the two? Oh, but that was a long time later. I went, um, so when I got to the country club, I went and I was a pastry chef. I went to Europe and studied and I studied with Albert Kuman in New York just to get a lot more pastry, mm -hmm. you know, and I would compete in things. But then I, ha and I got hired with Hyatt and worked really, really hard. I think Hyatt never had, 
less than a 12 hour day when I was there. I love the people, the customers. I love the company, but however, you know, hotel work is hard. Um, it was, it was good though. It was so worth it. Cause you learned a lot and I was young. It didn't feel hard, but I got married and got pregnant and said, I don't want to leave my kid in daycare on 18 hours on Christmas. So I had started a publishing company just fooling around doing all this culinary nutrition type stuff with the newsletter, making posters and doing things like that. And I just said, you know, I'm going to make this go. If I can't, I'll give it up and go back to work. Mm -hmm. And I never went back to food service calling until my, but I worked a lot with dietitians. Um, you know, I had, I was always doing something with cooking. I developed a big recipe database with pictures. I wrote books. I made, I mean, it expanded into what you see on, nutritioneducationstore.com and foodandhealth.com because I own those. And that was, you know, I made a lot of money with that. I mean, there was no doubt that it was the right thing to leave the industry at that time. Um, but when my son was going off to college, you know, you get those empty nester syndrome. And one of my friends was working, it was Al Zeman, the guy that actually had asked me to be the pastry chef. We stayed friends. He said, I really need somebody to help me with these rationale ovens like to do demos with them and stuff like that. And I saw how they worked very computerized. So I said, sure, I'll do that. You know, they sent me to all this training and then they said, well, why don't you see if you could be an instructor or one of the guys there just said, you know, Johnson and Wales always needs instructors and they have these ovens or so. I don't know how that conversation got started. And I thought, well, that would be so much fun to teach. This is the campus in Denver, correct? Yeah. And I went and applied and they said, you know what, you'd be perfect to teach the chef students, the pastry, because we can never get like, because you have the kitchen skills and the pastry skills, you know, in the education and the portfolio and stuff like that. So I did. And it was a success, you know, with, because I think those students would get frustrated learning pastry because they don't always have the dexterity and they needed somebody that could teach them well, but be patient, mm -hmm. you know, and I guess that I was always patient. Um, so I was doing that. And then the opportunity came up to teach the plate of desserts. And I did it in a very modernist way. I had a ball, like we had liquid nitrogen and all this. I had so much fun. And they said, you know, we would take you full time if you had a bachelor's degree. So that's when I went, I decided to go to Johnson and Wales online and get the bachelor's degree. Um, and then my son said, I want you to move to California. So I had to leave Johnson and Wales, which was heartbreaking because I love I love teaching on that campus. I love the students. I love the teachers. But I thought I still want to finish the bachelor's degree. Um, and I moved to the Bay Area and finished that online. And I loved it. The Johnson & Wales online program is so good. And I, I don't think you could ever say, well, which one is best? I mean, I think everybody could read the stuff and figure it out. They're good at different things. But to have it all is to have it all is lucky, Colin. The, we had... Um, just professors that opened my eyes in a very modern way to sustainability, to social justice, to art history, to sociology, to so many things. I had such a wealth of classes and the professors were all, you know, PhDs, very passionate about their topics, which caused the next step of the art. When I finished that degree. What was that degree again in the bachelor's? So the bachelor's was... Um, a bachelor's of science for food and culinary art and management. I have it on the wall. Yes. Bachelor of science, culinary arts and food service management. Um, summa cum laude colon. <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, I mean, that tells you that academically I can handle the rigor. So tell us about online. Cause maybe someone's listening. Do you online, do you have to do a residency? Do you have to show up? Is it all online? Is it from all over the world? For that bachelor's degree, it was all online which I think was okay when you're putting that on top of the associates and that, you know, externship in my work experience that was in, I guess you call real time or real world. It's so easy to just log in. And I almost feel like there's a part of online, if it's done well, where you can learn better because you can listen to the lectures over and over, mm -hmm. or, you know, you have to stop them to go do something else. You have that lifetime flexibility. I think it's good for someone who's disciplined, who's willing to sit down on Monday morning and crank it all out and not wait until Saturday night. 
And, you know, you can really network with the students in the forums. We were lucky enough to have instructors that would really ask engaging questions that were very relevant about the lessons. They would answer the emails right away. And the chefs were in charge of writing all the curriculum. So they knew we had their cell phones. So they knew if something was unclear or the links didn't work, they're going to hear about it. You know, so they were very thorough to make sure everything online was, you know, worked very well and they would respond to emails. I think that was, you know, very well done. I'm sure it's, you know, it's been there for a while. So it's, it was smooth. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we all enjoyed it and we all felt engaged in the forums. We did group assignments. You would get massive texts, text chats with your whole group to keep everybody. Cause some people would, you know, they'd be working two jobs and trying to go to school and they couldn't carry the load that other people could. So the, uh, we would all pitch in and do everything that we could. I mean, I probably did more work, but I didn't mind because I wanted the A. Um, and I, you know, you didn't mind. It was just such a nice group of people. Yeah. And this, this pros and cons, as you said, yeah. both face to face as well as online and this people and students for both. I've taken classes, both I've taught classes both you know so there is pluses and minuses to both of those and you know it's really what the what as a student is looking for and what they can you know some people can't travel yeah and i think it's just what your capabilities are i think in person is nice because you get to meet so many people especially if you're in the kitchen you get to meet so many people and you really learn from other people's you know, presentations or mistakes. I mean, Berkeley was all in person. And I think I really appreciated that because if it was a very artistic and graphic design. So if you're working on a project, you had to present it. And that meant everybody worked harder on it and present Like you could really learn a lot from presenting it and getting comments. I mean, it was just a very good to be in person. So you know, going to school at Berkeley was to help, help your business, what you're doing. We did at the time and what you're doing now as well. Yes, it was actually their their extension. I mean, it wasn't Berkeley proper, mm -hmm. um, but I was doing a lot of photography. I loved the art classes that I had at Johnson & Wales. It opened my eyes of art and art history. And when I saw the program at Berkeley, it was like a mini MFA. You know, the classes that you could get for photography and art and things like that were just so good. And I, you know, I really loved it. I mean, I think that's just, that's great of, you know, it's talk a little bit more about that because there's people listening and they might think they went to culinary school, they're going to have to go work in a restaurant. And really this industry has so many doors that you can open and you can take that like you did when you started a family and what yeah. you want to be in the restaurant, you wanted to be home, how you can take what you learned in that foundational type classes and use it in lots of other ways. Yes, I think so, Colin. That's, I'm glad you asked because I had a pitch about that in my recent master's degree, um, the presentation I gave. And, you know, they say you'll spend all this money and go to culinary school and get out and be a line cook. But the reality is food is a $1.1 trillion industry. You can be an entrepreneur. You can start, you know, food products. You can be a restaurant tour. You can sell to those people. You can work. There's so many, you know, two different supply chains. There's food service, consumer packaged goods. Um, there's all the equipment that's being developed. There's just so many things that you could do in a food-based industry. And I don't think being a line cook is bad. I think there's a lot of good cooking skills and people skills that you learn and, you know, muscle memory and dexterity with working and understanding people in that part of the industry and the creativity. You'd see a lot of things that you may apply to just something that could make you a lot of money later on. Mm -hmm. So I think you have to look at it holistically of your whole life, you know, if you love people and food and, you know, you like to work hard and hustle, um, it's good for, it's good for a lot of people, you know, if they don't feel like they have the smarts for engineering or they don't want to sit at a desk or, you know, they just like the hustle every day. There's people that love that lifestyle and it can be right for a lot of people, I think. Yeah, I agree. I think that people going into this career or uh, discipline or this degrees and getting it just know that there's so many avenues that yeah uh, what, like with the pandemic or if there's like economy changes depression you can always find something like if you went to be i don't know dental hygienist there's not many other roles that you can do right no. but here in food you could be a teacher you could be a photographer you could be a salesperson you know there's so many options yeah there are and now with social media 
I mean, you could really be an influencer. You can go on the food channel. There's just so many things that you could do with it. So you have to be creative and, and hustle, like work hard and pay your dues and just soak in as much as you can to try to be open-minded, I think. Okay, at this halfway point in the show, I want to take a quick pause and tell you about an amazing opportunity from one of the industry leaders in culinary and hospitality online education. Whether you are an individual looking to get more training in the front or back of the house that is documented through assessment and certification, or are a small or large hospitality business owner looking to find an effective and legitimate educational training institution that will provide your employees quick, easy, and affordable operational training, well then, the Pineapple Academy is for you. The Pineapple Academy is the premier provider of online education in the areas of food service training that is designed for both front and back of the house frontline workers in the restaurant and hospitality industries. Their current curriculum includes a variety of topics to fulfill your personal training needs, such as knife skills, food safety, customer service, cleaning and sanitation, and so much more. And during this time where staffing is a concern for everyone, their training programs provide an easy and affordable way for hospitality businesses and individuals to manage and implement a high-class training program. And as someone who has taken several of their training courses, I can honestly say that they are always focusing on the needs of their customers and the industry while constantly adding to their training library. They offer food service training solutions for individuals and businesses of any size in either an individual or group training format, depending on your specific needs. Their training is designed to be fast, effective, and an easy way to get real-world, practical knowledge for yourself or your team. And it is the perfect tool to onboard new team members and standardize your training. And the best news is you can get started for as little as $9.99 a month with their personal plan or $14.99 a month for their business plan. They also have custom options available for businesses as well. And you can try it for free before you buy because today I am including a custom link just for you in the show notes and description section of this episode, which will give you a 14-day free trial. So... What do you have to lose? Go and check out the Pineapple Academy today. I have really enjoyed their courses, and I know you will too. Okay, so now back to the show. Let me ask you a question. Do you think culinary school is needed? Is it required? Is it? Tell us what, what's your thoughts on that and looking back. I have a client that made me realize it really is needed. Because um, like you take in all this information, you know, there's so many different things of food that you can learn so quickly. Work, you could learn it through working. If you don't have the time and money to go to school, then you should work somewhere good. But I just think there's something about having that diploma and having that formal education with all those people and the network of people that you go to school with. It gives you so much beyond the knowledge. And I have a client right now. She's a caterer, very successful before the pandemic. She had the whole year sold. When the pandemic came, it knocked her out. She's rebooting her business. And when I just see all the things she's doing, she's making a lot of mistakes that I think she wouldn't make if she had the formal education of branding, cost control, writing men menus and cooking. Um, you see that and you see the value of what you have in school. I think, I think it's easy to be negative with school. There's friction, yeah. you know, there's, it's expensive. It's, you have to be on a regiment to go like things that feel good are not always good. Like, and things that are hard, feel hard are not always bad. So I think mm -hmm. it's just a matter of discipline and, and learning. It's a huge resource that's there that can accelerate you with all the knowledge of the people, you know, that you might not get any other way. And to learn, you know, the history of cooking and the styles and the genres and so many things, I think it would open more doors. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you agree as an instructor thought of it that way. 
Yeah, I mean, I think working in the industry and the apprentice program, you know, that can really teach you the, the cooking aspect, the craft of it. You know, as long as they expose you to enough cuisines and enough different chefs yeah. and their personalities, their styles. But yeah, I think the, the loss is the business. Yeah. Right? Like you mentioned, the human resources, the cost control, those things that will help you be successful yeah. in a business. Unless you went into like a management training program, or maybe they were going to teach you about P&Ls, income statements. But you're not going to get that working as a line cook. No, and I think you have to really learn the business aspects and the branding and things like that. I guess you probably, you would get some of that in the associate's degrees, you get a lot more as the bachelor's. And I could show people that you didn't necessarily have to do it all at once because <laughs> I just graduated from the master's program. Yeah. Tell us about that. What, why did you get a master's degree at 59? Yes. <laughs> and tell us why you picked the, why you picked the CIA for your <laughs> master's degree when there's so many master's degree programs out there. What, how did you narrow it in on that? It's a, it's so funny. Um, they had sent an email about this new food business school and they really cobbled together everything you really need to know to be successful in business. They've looked at, you know, the sustainability issues that we all have to address in our businesses. Um, well, tell us what it is. It's a master's, but what is the discipline, the degree specific? They call it food business, but it's kind of like what the CIA thinks that you need to have a successful food business, <laughs> which um, it's kind of crazy because it's new, but they've put together like design thinking, you know, that you need, basically you need to know your audience and research to really think out of the box, not just to do what you want to do or what you've always done, but to see what do people really need and how could you do something different than what everybody else is doing, you know, with branding, um, the cost, like the management class, was crazy. We probably had 30 hours of homework a week. Wow. That class. Um, I think like 20% of our class dropped out after that class because it was hard if you're working. Not good for retention. No. But um, well, I think they're gonna go back and stuff like that. It was just very, very rigorous. Is it all online or is it uh... yeah, well it's a hybrid. Um it's all in it's a hybrid except in the pandemic. But you go to this you go to the campuses in the summer. They have like a week long residency where you'd be full time in the summer. And then the rest of it is online. Um, and we also had a Facebook page and we were on Facebook every single week, just trying to figure, you know, what did they really want with this assignment? Or, you know, what was your take on this? Or we would add in, you know, news things that we were reading or just our personal news. Like we really became such a tight community. And I think, especially through the pandemic, but it was really good for food branding and business to learn what you need to do in today's business environment. Um, I took the CPG track and I learned a lot about sustainability and how to make things responsibly. You know, there's so many different issues that you have to consider and it's sort of almost personal to everyone in every business to be more mindful of, you know, what's going on with global warming and, you know, the plants and the ant you know, the animals, like the kindness to all the stakeholders, the animals, the people, um, you know, the soil, just to make more, the packaging, the waste, like food waste, food deserts, you know, they really brought to light all these issues. So I think that really was the bond that drove everybody to want to do the program is to want to be more responsible and be more plant-based mm -hmm. and to learn how to have a business. If people wanted a master's degree, I think for people in hospitality or food service, it's very convenient. So when I got the email and I saw the content, the price and the format, that was a no brainer. There was just nothing else like it. Right. Who are the faculty? They bring people from outside the industry experts. Yeah. So they bring in experts um, that are not teachers, which I think has pros and cons. Like you can probably learn what's going on in the industry, but they don't have as much time as professors. Um, they're working on that to get, you know, to get them help and get stuff. They're building it. So it's hard. Mm -hmm. But I think that you get a lot of, you know, very real industry experience with it, you know, and good topics. And maybe some of them, a professor really couldn't teach. Like we had a supply chain manager 
for a big company come in and she taught us all the issues and the way she makes decisions. There's really not a professor that could have taught you that. Mm -hmm. So I think the good is just really, really good. It's so good, you know, with what we learned. And that was pretty creative getting a Facebook group. Did they not have part of their learning management system, their platform? Did they not have discussion boards, discussion groups that you guys had to go? They on? did. I mean, they absolutely did, but there just wasn't a place that you could go, you know, cause semesters start and end. And so you wouldn't really have that support. I think we all just wanted to be connected for networking mm -hmm. was really the purpose of it is, oh, wow, like there's 48 of us and we're all so interesting. Like we want to just be together to network. We want to have a space to go. And then you could keep that after the after the degrees over too. you'd still have that access that, that. Yeah, exactly. And I think when the pandemic hit, it just made it made so much chaos in everybody's lives in the instructors. If you were going to the you know, the conventions to all of us, there was a chef that like his resort closed. He had to move his whole family to go open a new one. It, the pandemic caused so much chaos that it was a very helpful tool for us. And, you know, we like it because we could discuss things 24 seven. It, it wasn't depending on the school semester and they weren't there. I mean, you could say things to each other that you couldn't really say. You're right. They're not. They're not watching. They're not monitoring it or. And not. Not that we would. Not that we would. It's just that you could say, you know, I really didn't understand this, and then everybody would agree. So then everybody would write, or somebody would say, well, oh, it's so obvious. It's this or this, and okay, and then you know, you didn't have to write in. Mm -hmm. It was just you felt like you could say something without looking dumb. Mm -hmm. I guess. It was just like, what in the world are we supposed to do on this? That wasn't all the time. A lot of times people were like, oh, look at this article about plant-based meat. Like, did you try this? You know, it could be off topic mm -hmm. and just kind of interesting, right. I guess. Now, how long was the program? Was it two years, a year? It was two years. Two years. Yeah, two years. I think we started in like September of 2019 and we finished in August of 2021. So it was fun. I mean, I highly recommend it. Great. And what are you what are you doing now? I, I see you're doing photography. Yes. So now you've branched into something. Tell us about your newest venture, one, right? Yes. Um, that was it started at Berkeley because we had to define who we were as an artist. And I had, you know, with the photography, I had shot everything from icebergs to goats. I did shoot a lot of food. So you kind of told your story and came in with the stuff. Like it was a self-awareness thing and you would develop a portfolio with a, a vision as an artist and it just gravitated towards food. I mean, that was my whole life and I found a very artistic ways to shoot it. Uh, and I posted all that online, Colin, and I, I started getting phone calls. I had companies flying me to LA to shoot bread factories. I had an app fly me all over the country for a year because wow. I could style and shoot the food. Um, it's, you can't just style, like you have to be really good with the camera. You know, I had had a lifetime with it and the formal art. I, I think like everything I learned just kicked in for it. Mm. And I really like to help businesses. Like I really love it. But you know, when I hit the CIA, I really learned how to be competitive and the branding like that just helped me take my business to the next level. It really went up 10 levels, you know, from furthering my education with the master's degree. So I have a home studio and I help a lot of clients, you know, they send me, they send me stuff and I figure out really fun ways to use it. And I shoot the food in its package at different uses. Um, and it's bleeding into products. I have a whole thing full of like handmade Italian sunglasses in there right now. Um, I'm helping out a magazine with olive oil. And learning a lot about that, you know, just whatever comes in, you're on it. Right. So you <laughs> well, I checked I checked out your website and it looks uh, great. I saw your studio. You have an indoor, you have an outdoor, you have access to the yeah. kitchen. There's a lot going on there. So how can someone see what you're doing? How can they follow you? How can they contact you? Do you, you have some websites? Yes, thank you for asking, Colin. It's Judy Doherty Photography.com. And on in, my Instagram is at Judy Doherty Photography, like all that's on the website. And you still have the other two websites, businesses too? Yeah. My businesses are e-commerce and I um, develop them. Everything is automated. So they, you know, they, they sort of run themselves and I have people working for me that do the writing, you know, cause I can't be the only one who writes and creates content. So I, right. I do work hard on it. 
you know, every month I set aside time. What What are those sites too? So I'm going to put all that in the show notes. So if someone's listening, they can, they can reach out to you if they want to. So the blogging site that has like the recipe database and the, the membership newsletter and, you know, all the content we're creating every month, that's foodandhealth.com. I've had that for 25 years. Mm. And then the e-commerce site with all the posters, it's just resources for health and nutrition is nutritioneducationstore.com. Um, I really love, you know, to make posters. It just has a lot of like fun prizes for wellness fairs and things like that. It's just very creative. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't have to pack the boxes. I have a company that does that. So that really is what enabled me to have time for the photography. So what's what's next for you? Where, where do you see yourself going now? Um, <laughs> probably it's just to stay doing the photography and, you know, enjoy life. I'm vaccinated. So to enjoy life coming out of the pandemic to where you can, you know, do more things. Mm-hmm. So that's pretty much it. There isn't anything really big rumbling. Not that there couldn't be. You know, I love to learn new things and just grab opportunities that you see and work hard. I think, I guess that's the whole point of education. You might learn something new that you never knew before. I think that's the great thing about it, right? Mm -hmm. As an instructor, I'm sure you've seen a lot of that where kids all of a sudden open their eyes to something they didn't see before. Sure, it's true with me. I never, when I was in culinary school, I never thought I'd be teaching. I never thought I'd have a PhD. I never thought any of that. You know, I thought I'd be in a restaurant. That's what we were trained for, right? Go to restaurants, hotels. Yeah. But, you know, life changes. There's a lot of doors that open, doors that close, different pathways. And, you know, yeah. it's funny where you end up. And, you know, it's true. And did you find, I have a question for you, Colin. Did you find that it was hard to go from master's to PhD? Like, how much work was that? And what did you like about it? Like, did you learn a lot or? Yeah, it's it's a big jump. It's a it's like you it's know a big jump. Okay. the the bachelor associates bachelors, you know, and then the math. It's kind of like all like steps, and yeah. then you go to that the next one, and it's just a huge. I look at it like a marathon. You know, you just oh. got to take your time. It's not a rush. It's not like this lower degrees. You just, you know, you just chip away a little bit at a time. It took you know it takes some people ten years. It took me six six wow. years to go through and then you got the dissertation phase so you know i think there was some people that may have done it in five you know but there if you're usually have careers or families it's you know you take it a little bit slower nobody yeah. should be getting a phd at, in their 20s you know you want to go out and get a life experience first yeah um, but it's really good because it really uh, get you to study in depth whatever your topic is, whatever your subject is. And you can really do the research on it and spend a lot of time with like-minded people. So it's like the masters on steroids. Yeah, no, that sounds wonderful. What was your topic, if you don't mind me asking? I have my PhD in uh, education leadership and research methodology. Oh, so that's I'm an nice. edu- educator, administrator. And uh, my topic was Canadian chefs perceived value of formal culinary education and it's uh, I forget the exact wording but it's impact on career success <laughs> oh that's good okay <laughs> yes and the research found I mean probably anyone could look it up you know it's public uh, that they found that they do value professional chefs do value culinary education formal culinary education they do look for that and they do pay a higher rate ah, okay. you know, usually in when i did this study uh, they do pay higher for someone that does come out of culinary school and they do put a value on it so okay. that proved and that was because as an educator i often got asked by especially parents is this worth it? What's my return on investment? Is this a good thing? And and you're always like, you know, you're going to give them the, the company message. Yes, yes, you know, but yeah. you know, maybe not true for all. But then you're like, well, is it really true? I mean, should I ask the industry? I mean, as a person that hired back in earlier careers as an executive chef, I always looked for that because I knew they knew the vocab. I knew they knew basic how to hold a knife. I knew they knew stuff. And they had commitment, right? They spent two years and a lot of money getting that degree. So they were going to, you know, we weren't just doing this until something better came along. So yeah. I personally valued it, but I wasn't sure if the industry overall did. So, and it proved that it did. Yeah, I think it does. I mean, I think there's always, you know, if you're really talented and you, I guess the, the story of El Bully shows us that, but I mean, in the end, El Bully did close. Maybe it's because he didn't have all the, you know, accounting or They just got tired or whatever, you know, there's all these stars, Mm -hmm. but I just think, you know, the meat is really disciplining yourself and, you know, reading things and learning to follow instructions. That's, 
you know, there's a lot of things that education gives you. Mm-hmm. It's fun. I love to learn. So <laughs> that's why I do too. I have uh, five degrees and I'd love to get another one, but my, my wife is like, no way. I'd love to get a law degree. Oh, wow. She's like, no, you're done. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah, because you probably would love that. But anyway. So as we come to the end of our chat today, before we wrap up, is there any last minute advice or guidance that you want to leave with the listeners, something you want to share? Um, I just hope I've inspired them to think about, you know, the food as a huge industry with lots of opportunity and to go to as much school as they can and just work really hard. You know, don't ever take your foot off the pedal, like just keep working (laughs) because it'll take you places and you'll discover things you never knew were there and you'll, you know, be an important part of our food world. So I guess that's my, my lesson and my story. Where do you think culinary schools are going to go now that you mentioned that? Because, you know, there's a lot closing. We had talked earlier about Johnson & Wales, Denver and Miami, a lot of the art institutes, the Cordon Bleu, the New England Culinary Institute up in Montpelier. You know, there's some change going on in culinary education, hospitality. There's more community colleges coming on, apprenticeships. Do you have any thoughts on that or where you think it may end up? Um, I have no idea. I mean, with the pandemic, it's... I think we've had like a compression, but I think as things, you know, start opening up because they said like the surges are really coming down. They feel like this was the last of it. So many people are vaccinated or they've had it, you know, everything is opening up. A lot of the restaurants can't get enough workers and the hotels. So I think there's going to be a lot of specialty schools, perhaps like people that really love, you know, pastry or they want to do that. And I mean, I just urge everybody to never leave the business side out of it. Like if you want to learn to cook or carve ice or any of these magnificent things you see on the food channel, the art, the pastry, the chocolate, whatever it is, it's so fun to see it and learn it, but don't ever leave the business out. I think if you really learn that, you know, that'll take you places to how to brand yourself and how to make a profit Mm -hmm. and serve all the stakeholders really well. Um, There's just that business acumen that you get, but it'll be interesting to watch Colin with, you know, the way our world keeps turning. Mm. Now, what about food styling, food photography? Cause that's, you know, you don't see a school based around that. I mean, it's just classes out there. What would, what would someone do? Like if they wanted to, you know, come shadow you or take classes, how do they learn that? Um, usually they can go to, there's um, websites like staff me up or, you know, just wherever you see jobs and you can look to be an assistant. Cause you, most of those they've, the real formal like advertising food stylists, like they've worked for somebody else as their assistant for five years, and then they launch out into their own. And it's really about your portfolio. You know, it's somebody will look at your portfolio and they'll either hire you or they won't. Mm. So I think it's probably good to have some formal training with food. It would make it easier and to work on a portfolio or try to be an assistant to see if you like it. Those, those kinds of jobs where you're freelance are hard because you don't always have the money coming in. A lot of them work two jobs and they do that, you know, as part-time or, you know, they've been at it a while, but it's still, it's like dog eat dog and it's a grind, but it's possible. So there's not really a school. They would go to a class. It's really apprentice type model. You got to go and learn it on the job. Yeah. But a lot of them did go to culinary school. You know, they're working in the industry. They get an opportunity to help somebody They're good at it, um, and then they'll just make a go of it. Can they make a living? Can they get paid? Does it pay well? I mean, without giving away anything that you've, Uh, you know, specific, but I mean, what? Yeah, I mean, I'm not, like, specifically a food stylist. I just offer that in my, like, I have the studio where I can receive the food and shoot the food. It's more of, like, an imaging business to make the images, and I can offer the styling so I can be more competitive with my pricing. And people like the way I style the food. Um, if you wanted to just food style, I think you can make good money at it. I'd probably try to go to New York mm. where most of it, like New York and Chicago is where most of that work is done. And you could work, you know, as someone's assistant, see if you like it, you get great skills. I don't know if the schools are teaching that. I think the schools teach enough about how to cook and present stuff. That would be so, because if you didn't know that and you tried to assist somebody, you'd really struggle. But if you went to school and learned all that and then, you know, just polished it as someone's assistant, you would launch pretty quickly and successfully. 
I think. And you'd probably need to be in a place like New York or Chicago where there's just a big demand for that, for all the advertising sure, work. Right. Those two cities are you know, really big for that. So it, anything is possible. Yeah. Now, what about TV and media? I know you've been on you know, PBS, television, you've had some appearances and you know, obviously the magazines and stuff, that whole media part of it. How does someone get into that? you have any advice for someone that wants to be? Yeah, I think if you have an amazing Instagram or TikTok channel and you use hashtags and you're really working the social media world, that's an easy way to get into all that. Um, you probably could also look on the job boards if they're looking for assistance, either for part-time or contract or full-time work. That would be a great way to get in you know, it's luck with your timing. If you know people that are doing it and they can invite you in on jobs, there's all different ways to get it, you know, to watch the job boards. And what are the job boards if someone's listening that they wanted to go check out? I think, you know, LinkedIn is a big deal to have nice, you know, to really polish up all their own social media channels. It shouldn't, it should really work on that you know, to have something that doesn't turn people off, that looks polished, that looks like you're learning and you're making great things. I mean, they could have a really engaging TikTok and Instagram channel, you know, with just fun things that they're making. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of a lot of the media is looking for that. It's a really fast way in and they can get a big following and things like that. And just to watch all the ones and see what they're doing. If you watch, you know, the food channel and, and all that stuff, it gives you an awareness of it. So I think they could go that route, mm -hmm. definitely. Yeah, I'm thinking about more of a personal brand along those lines because yeah, to build a brand, keep that social media more towards you know not less the social type of things that you're doing with your friends, but more on what you're doing for a career because yeah. I get a lot of requests to be a friend on Facebook and stuff. And when I look at it, and I'm like, well, you have nothing in common with me. You have nothing filled out on you. Why would I? Why yeah. do you want to? Why do you want to network with me? I'd be happy to network if you have something to do with food or cooking or yeah. media or something. But when there's nothing there. I mean, yeah. start, build it. Yeah, and it's just so much work to build it. So build it to something that can make you look good in your career, you know, clean it all up. Um, I think that helps them. You know, they could have blogs and websites to just be social forward. I think that would help everybody. Yeah, it's like the business card of the modern day, right? <laughs> yeah, because the companies see that you have a following and they like your voice and your story because you're kind of an ambassador for every company. They're they go and look at all that social stuff so much, you know, they, they really scrutinize it. So you have to make it really good, I think. Mm -hmm. And we really focused on that in our master's degree. We had um, professors from like Edelman, you know, ones that are really working in the CPG world that, or they had been, you know, brand managers for places like Cliff Bars. They really taught us a lot about branding and social media. I feel like that was the success of the whole program because you couldn't have gotten that anywhere else with the food business school. Yeah. They, the conferences were really fun because they brought in like what everybody's doing with plant-based stuff. You know, we learned about places like Dirt Candy in New York City. I love that chef and everything she's doing. And they're so engaged in social media, yeah. you know, for the, not just to brag about themselves, but for the good. That's Amanda Cohen, I think it runs at her own. Yes. Store. Yeah. That was Amanda Cohen. Or we were really studying like, you know, Atelier Crenn to see how she was all about keeping the employees and the vendors going during COVID, you know, just to have selling like all these meals for the hospital workers. And then that would keep her employees busy. It would keep the vendors in business. Like so many of them were just so selfless on their social media. And I think that was the lesson that we learned is, you know, just being part of this world and giving back. Yeah. Social media should be more about that than trying to take or give your opinion or, you know, any of those things. It's just not the platform for it. Right. Give it away. Yeah. Provide provide value. Yeah, to provide value. Absolutely. So that was, I guess, my greatest lesson at 59 <laughs> with the Masters. <laughs> awesome. Well, that is just about all the time we have for this episode. And I want to first thank you, Judy, for coming on the show today and sharing your culinary school story with all of us. We really appreciate your time, your insight, and your honesty. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Colin. It's a pleasure to be here. Great. Thanks again. I enjoyed our chat. Bye-bye now. Okay. Bye-bye. And a big thanks and appreciation also goes out to all of you, the listeners. We hope you enjoy the show and this episode. You all are a big part of this show, so please let us know what you think. Your comments are always welcome, and they help us in making the best show possible. You can email them to culinaryschoolstories at gmail.com. That's culinaryschoolstories at gmail.com. 
or even leave us a voicemail at area code 207-835-1275. That's area code 207-835-1275. And if you like the show, we have a big ask of all of you, and that is to share the podcast with everyone you know and to give us a positive rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Okay, until our next Culinary School Story, take care and be well. Bye-bye. Culinary School Stories is a proud member of the Food Media Network.